Okay then, well, good morning mate, um, good to have you on. Uh, I'm joined here with Alex Hurst for the next episode of the VT series. Uh, Alex, how are you today? Yeah, really good mate, uh, things are going well, uh, things are picking up quite nicely on the back of Covid, so yeah, thanks for having us mate, I appreciate you having me on board. Yeah, perfect. Um, Al, so for those who don't know, can you just tell us a little bit more about yourself, so how you got into the fitness industry and you know what you're doing at the moment, what, what sort of roles have, have you got in the industry? Yeah, of course. Um, I got into the fitness industry on the back of uh, a rugby career, so I kind of started my studies uh, early 2010, 2011, um, so I started studying whilst I was a full-time pro. Uh, and then just kind of digressed from there. So as I came out of the full-time game, just started studying more and more. Uh, went initially into your, your standard gym instructor roles. Um, did a little bit of lifeguarding as well, just to throw that rogue me in there. Um, but then I started going into the personal training aspects more down 2013 way when I got qualified. Uh, and one of my first personal training roles was over in Australia, believe it or not. Um, and then did a little bit of work down in London and then just been um, kind of digressed into education a little bit for, on the back of that, um, which probably le links into my, my more current roles. Um, so I, I work with education providers um, like yourself. Um, so doing uh, assessing, tutoring, tutoring and training, um, but also do one-to-one uh, -one clients as well. So do personal training clients anywhere from you know sports specific work I've done a lot of work with rugby teams in the past um as well as different professionals anywhere from golf football you know different athletes in that sense and then your general clientele as well um done a lot of group exercise work so linked to like the indoor cycling which have done more recently but done a lot of classes over the years you know your standard stuff like your, your box fit your uh your circuit classes x y and z um and then just finishing off uh, my degree at the minute, which is sports rehabilitation. So that uh, focuses more on the musculoskeletal side, uh, similar to like how a physiotherapist would work with uh, MSK conditions. Uh, so it's the, the diagnosis, the examination, and then the treatment of injuries and also the prevention of injuries as well. Um, and then work with an, uh, an equipment provider as well. Um, it's called Matrix Fitness UK. Um, so we deliver kit out quite a lot of the gyms in the UK, one of the largest providers, uh, the largest growing, uh, I forgot my words, <laughs> uh, they're the largest brand, uh, largest growing brand in the UK. Um, but yeah, so when a, a gym gets equipped by Matrix, I'll, I'll go in and deliver some of the, the training depending on uh, where the location is. There's a trainer down south uh, and there's a trainer up north as well. So uh, a quite, quite a bit of variety there for you. Yeah, yeah, it's far to say. I don't really know where to start on there. Uh, there's plenty of stuff there to, to get stuck into. Um, just before we get on to kind of some of those roles and, and how you're adapting, you know, with COVID and, and how that's affected you, just a quick one. We have got a guest or a couple of guests coming on the next couple of weeks who are actually over in Australia in the fitness industry. Right. Over there. Um, and we want to find out a little bit more about the industry over there and their sort of experiences. But when you went over there as a, as a probably a recent PT. How did you find it? Was a, you know, briefly, was there a bit of a difference or, you know, very similar sort of scene to the UK? Yeah, I, at the time, it, like I said, it was like 2013 that I was over there working. Um, I thought they were much more ahead of the game than we were. Um, yeah. You could see that there was, you know, early, early on in the early 2010s, um, there was a lot less integration in the UK in terms of, you know, chicks coming onto the resistance area, coming onto the free weights area, whereas, you know, over there, it was already happening quite prominently. Um, there's much more of a, a culture driven towards um, fitness and exercise as well. If you think of, so I, I lived over in the Gold Coast um, and it's quite an aesthetic culture. You know, it's very much beach mentality, surfer lifestyle. So a lot of the time spent, you know, with minimal clothing on long story short. So I think a lot of the people out there want to look good. Um, so the, there was a large buying of fitness as in comparison to maybe in the UK where, you know, it's, it's growing, you know, it's, it's one of the biggest growing industries, isn't it over here? But, you know, it, I thought it was accelerated over there a little bit quicker than over here. Okay, interesting. Good. Gold Coast, love it. Were you, uh, what, were you working in the gym there? Is it a, a big uh, commercial gym or is it a PT studio? 
Yeah, it was uh, a fitness first, um, yeah. which are, are out there as well. So, yeah, I was doing it while I was playing uh, over out, out there in rugby as well. Um, so I was out there playing for the Tweed Eggs Eagles, but ruptured my bicep first game. So spent a lot more time in the gym than I probably would have liked to, to be honest. Obviously, I wanted to focus on the rugby at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, just kind of digressed in a different way. But that accelerated my learning in terms of the fitness industry, you know, quite, quite well because I took on – much more clients much more uh group exercise than i probably would have initially if i was spending a lot more time at the footy ground yeah that's where you got the bug um so in terms of you know your current roles i know you've got kind of your finger in in a lot of pies at the moment you know with us in in terms of you know your tutoring your assessing your matrix uh, you've got your indoor cycling you've got your own uh, personal training and rehab business that we're going to discuss in in a little bit more detail um uh, shortly how has um covid19 really affected those roles for you because i know that you know obviously like part-time freelance they kind of they all join up to be your full-time job really don't they um how has it affected you the lockdown and, and the whole situation at the moment yeah it's affected me massively um you know as a you know, it's kind of the pros and cons of being a freelancer and a contract worker. Um, obviously, I've got the flexibility to accept and change and, you know, refuse shifts as and where needed, uh, you know, to kind of get everything to fit in quite nicely. But with lockdown occurring, obviously, all gyms closed down. So I didn't have the flexibility to go in and train staff. You know, I couldn't go in and educate staff on, you know, CPD or uh, actual gym installed days. Um, so a lot of the work actually dried up quite quickly. Um, so it, it very much transitioned to some online assessing and marking. And then obviously that's where I found a little bit of a loophole and a, and a weakness in my armor that I was, a, I was quite reliant on companies kind of spoon feeding me the work, um, which, you know, it, it's not necessarily a negative. That's kind of, you know, especially with being the, a full-time student at the same time as well, it, it kind of suited me, but, you know, it, it definitely does highlight the, the weakness in the armory now, but, but you know, that's where, you know, the new business is coming in quite nicely to, to kind of be self-sufficient, you know, whether it's, whether it's going to be the, the primary role or the secondary role, that's, I think that's going to be, you know, the, the juggling thoughts coming out of COVID uh, and coming out of lockdown. Um, and we'll just have to see how that develops. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of personal trainers um, who just purely do personal training, or a lot of them are self-employed and we're in the same sort of position, especially with the, you know, the facilities maybe having to close, um, how did you find, you know, financially, were you able to get the furlough, the self-employed uh, scheme that they set up, you know, were you able to access any of that, any of your employers or, you know, how did that go? No, nothing. Um, because I was, so in 2018, um, well, 2017, 2018, I was transitioning from full-time as well as doing self-employed work, but because my full-time role gave me more money than my self-employed role. Yeah. That meant that I, I'm not eligible for it. Um, so it's a bit of a funny one and a bit of a kick in the teeth, really. But, you know, it is what it is. Um, you know, I think the government have done a great job in, in terms of supporting a lot of people. But yeah. unfortunately, I fell through the cracks where, you know, it's, I, I wasn't eligible for anything at all. So, you know, luckily, um, I have been getting work coming in, you know, more online work, um, you know, which I think highlights the, the need for, uh, a transition into more technological advances in the in the fitness industry. Um, uh, Pre COVID, if you would have told me I'm going to go into an online uh, service, I would probably would have laughed at you. <laughs> but I think why like, the way that these products are now tailoring themselves to to kind of support clients, to support trainers, and and make it more accessible for everyone. You know, it's it's kind of the way the industry is going, and I don't think it's going to take a backward step, or I don't think it's going to change again to go back to how it was like uh, I know a lot of people are saying this is the new normal like it's not the new normal (laughs) like there's nothing normal about it this is a complete different time so to say it's a new normal I think is a little bit kind of misleading you know this is just a complete change of times you know I think the fitness industry as a whole is probably going to be transitioning 10 15 years faster than it was to, go, going to do you know the amount of technology you know look at look at zoom i don't think you know, many people would have known about zoom 10 weeks ago yeah. <laughs> and i know everyone uses it as a mainstay yeah. in their business now unless you didn't unless unless you used it for work you know previously 
you know, the average person who maybe works, you know, retail or anything like that would never have used it, would they? Um, yeah. So definitely Zoom is definitely one of them. How have you found, um, as you said there, you would have laughed if it was 10 weeks ago when we said, you know, you're going to go all online and, and things like that. How have you found that with your experiences in the industry? How have you found transferring to online, delivering communications? And do you think there's any, um, any ways that it could further be improved? Something that you'd like to be improved in terms of that uh, delivery model, you know, moving forward? Um, in terms of improvements, I'm still getting fully to grips with it initially. So, um, <laughs> to be fair, I'm quite impressed with what you can do um, with some of the systems that I'm using. So, they're, they're very much uh, habitual tracking. So, I can uh, set habits. I can tra track your adherence on that. You've obviously got your, your applications like My Fitness Pal and other nutrition uh, trackers, which can then make it a bit more holistic as well. Um, with writing programs, I found that quite enjoyable you know you can link programs you can link videos you can link tutorials you can make it as in-depth as you want and you can get instant feedback from the client so uh, I, I was blown away with how interactive these systems can be uh, and how effective they can be because my argument was always well if you can't see them doing it you're not very supportive but if the client can now video themselves doing it upload the video and you've got instant feedback now I basically you know it's going back to the old um every exercise is a test and every test is an exercise, you know, so I can make every set and every rep accountable if the client is willing to upload it and send it. Um, so if they have any problems at all, let's say if it was squats, you know, squats is probably one of the most common where people want to change and amend form and get lower depths and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, so if, if they video their uh, three sets of squats, whatever it is, um, I can then analyze each rep and then I can create my program and, and adjust it on the back of it. Um, similar to you know sleep patterns you can upload your sleep pattern and let's say you had a crummy night last night and you you know you, you slept three hours and i've i've got a, a hit session plan for you or a strength session which is going to you know demand a lot from you you're probably not going to get the most out of it so i may i may be able to transition your hip slash strength day to another day which you're going to get a bit more value out of and then re reprogram it if that makes sense um so to get that interact interaction is quite cool um, which I didn't realize you could do so much of. Do you think that just kind of um, developing on what you've said there in terms of them uh, tracking and telling you everything that they're doing, filling in online, you can see instantly then it's not just the case of seeing them two, three times a week uh, face to face. Do you think it's even more important than for trainers to build relationships with the clients online because ultimately they can send a video in, yeah, but they're not going to video every single exercise within that session, are they? Because it's just, you know, not feasible, really. It's going to be time, time consuming. Um, you know, would you say it's even more important than to build relationships so there is a trust and the accountability? You know, you, you can really build that within the, the trainer and the client. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I think I, I try and cut out some of that where we do a lot of screening initially with clients. So I, I'll ask them to perform, you know, certain screening tests send me them screening tests and I can kind of iron out some of the issues already. But yeah. I think you're absolutely right. You know, a lot of it is, you know, are the clients going to buy into it? Are they, can I trust them to do it? Because, you know, with a lot of these systems, you can just go tick, 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 mm -hmm. tick. I've done it all and they haven't actually done it. But, you know, when it, when, when it comes down to it, if you're paying, you know, some of these systems that I've seen online are the best part of £400 a month, you know, to have this online training. I'm not charging that. I wish I was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, if, if you're paying that money, then it, it, it's down to you to get the results. You know, we know we've, even with face-to-face -face personal training, you might see your client once a week for one hour. You might, you might be lucky enough to see him three or four times a week. That's still only four hours mm. within a week, which is a very small percentage. So then you might deliver the best personal training session in the world. They might drive straight out of there and go to McDonald's for argument's sake. And then all the, the bad habits around it, you know, so how do we keep them um, accustomed to the plan and working towards it and keeping them accountable? That, that, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? And it's finding that right system. I think supporting it with stuff like Zoom calls. So like, you know, weekly uh, Zoom calls to evaluate how's, how's your week gone? How's each training session gone? You've obviously got the instant messaging, um, you know, whether it's WhatsApp or use the applications as well. Um, it's just keeping tabs and just trying to, 
push him in the right direction as well. Giving him education. I think one of the, the most missed things from personal training is, oh, I'll just bring him in, I'll flog him, I'll put him through a session, but I won't actually teach him why they're doing it. And I think uh, a lot of the best trainers will actually educate and encourage clients to learn as to why they're doing it. So let's say you, your current training phase, well, why, why are you actually doing that current training phase? You know, what, what is the main purpose of it? Have you set goals? So are they working towards their specific goal or have you just wrote them just a, a random session which is going to give them a bit of a push? Because, you know, with, with personal training, it's you know, some of the easiest things to do and make people so sick and tired and sweaty. But is that always the right thing to do? You know, what about if they need to deload at certain points? What about if they need to work on uh, technique? What about if they need to work on mobility? It's not always about let's flog them as hard as we can. Um, you know, so there, there is a little bit of a mixture there which we do need to work on. And, you know, the, that's where I'm impressed with these systems. I, everything that you upload, I can then question. So if, let's say, if you, you're my client and you uploaded your, your nutrition, I can have a quick look over it and go, Bitch, you're, on, you're on the right track, you're doing a great job, mate. Or if not, I can then, you know, set up a call with you and say, look, where, where are you struggling with? How can I help you? You know, there, there is different ways to it. I know you can do that face-to-face as well, but, you know, yeah. that, that's how I've adapted a little bit through this time. So do you think, obviously speaking for yourself, but other PTs that you may know, do you think that some PTs may not return to the gym then after this period? Do you think that they may just go fully online, you know, cut the cost in terms of rent, they've built great relationships, whatever, systems, etc. cetera. Do, do you think that there's going to be a bit of a spike where people think, you know what, I'm not going to go back to pure, I'm not going to go back to the top, I'm not going to go back to X, Y, Z. Um, I prefer this, this type of delivery. It's more cost effective for me as a business. Do you think that's going to happen? Potentially. I think, I think there will be an element of it um, because I think if you look around the UK, you know, I know the first couple of months of lockdown, you know, you, you looked on every fitness website and everything was sold out. So all the, all the equipment's out there somewhere. So I think a lot of people have now started to get out the garages, the homes and, you know, getting the, the basics. Um, so I think personally, it's, it's going to de- depend on what, you, what your clientele is saying. You know, if you've got um, fit, uh, 40 clientele, which all want to return back to the gym, then you're still going to need to go back to the gym. Um, you know, if, if you it could also transition what you're offering as well. Why can't you offer both? Maybe a bit more of a hybrid system. So you, you can actually go back to the gym, return with your 40 clients face to face, but then you can support it with a supplementary 2030 online as well. Um, but it also might integrate the, the systems that you do use, that you now integrate it all together to actually track them 40 clients that you've got already as well. Um, so I suppose, you know, cut, cutting back to the, uh, the question, I think some, some clients probably won't want to come back to the gym because they might have spent the best part of a thousand pound on gym equipment. So they might just want that online guidance. There's some people that, you know, they, they probably slumped all the way through lockdown <laughs> and, and not touched anything, not done any form of exercise and, and, and need the guidance. You know, it's, it, it's all client dependent, I suppose. And it's all environmental, I suppose, as well. Um, you know, do, do you own your own facility? Are you renting? You know, is it more cost effective to just do that model? You know, there's so many variables to consider. Uh, for me, I, I'm going to try and transition to a, a hybrid model where I am delivering face-to-face as well, because I still think, you know, fundamentally, people still want coaching. You know, yeah. so a lot of people like to work to it. You know, remember the first couple of weeks of lockdown when it was hit session after hit session after hit session yeah. on Facebook it's Live, on Instagram Live, and, you know, it, it just went absolutely bonkers and too, and too much, really. So um, I think there's a lot of value of actually getting people in and coaching. Um, and I think that's what people want as well, the one-to-one interaction. Yeah, definitely, I agree. Um, you know, face-to-face is king, isn't it? You know, Zoom, Zoom's the one below, you know, the one below that's email, no, phone call, sorry, one below that's email. You know, one below that is the bottom of the gutter, it's your <laughs> Instagram message or something. <laughs> um, but face-to-face is still king. But yeah, I do, I do think there's going to be a massive swing to hybrid. Because um, I think... You know, if you just say, yeah, I'm just offering face-to-face or I'm just offering online, some people will think, well, why aren't you doing both now? Because you know, everyone, everyone's going to be doing that, I think, soon. So I think uh, it's definitely a strong, strong option. Just before we kind of delve into uh, your new business and, you know, your recent degree and how that's kind of created the new business and the sort of offering that you're going to be doing out, um, I just want to touch upon Matrix. Uh, I know that you are you're an educator for Matrix. You go into different facilities when they've got new... Uh, in stores, etc. Uh, don't you? How has 
How has COVID affected Matrix? And have you got any information directly from them or that sort of industry in terms of, you know, installs and, um, you know, big, big supply agencies like that? Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, not too much, mate, even being honest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, bit, being freelance and a little bit yeah. of, uh, you know, contract work. And, and like I say, all, all the facilities closing down and, like I generally go in for refits and uh, and in full installs and you know if they've been uh, sent some of our Phoenix equipment whether um, you know the the brand new Trojan horses kind of thing which are the uh, the new ones coming out on the market which may be a little bit more niche uh, I, I've not been sent anywhere well, for obvious reasons yeah. um, but at the, so at the same time there's there's not really been much movement on that behalf um, so I couldn't really tell you too much about it from being honest um, I think they're just getting ready to return slowly back to normal uh, i know some installs are now slowly starting to go back in so they are starting to refit some gyms out but again it's you know how long before we can go in and actually train staff is a, is a very different matter because i think a, a, a lot of the gyms are considering do we need to move equipment around you know do, do we go back to the same format we had and put some machines out of order or you know do we change the layout of the gym and maybe make it kind of like a pod system where you've got let's say a, a treadmill, a row or a bike, along with some kettlebells and dumbbells, um, and you kind of book that pod out for X amount of time, or are you going to change it to like a, a linear route around the gym where you go from one station to the other, so you go from your cardio, you go to your resistance machine, you go to your free weights, and then you kind of go through the, the back door mm. uh, to leave. Uh, you know, it's, mm. I know some facilities are planning to go back, you know, straight away in early July. I know some people are, are kind of sitting on the fence and going, no, we're going to watch what mistakes people make and we're going to come back, you know, maybe August time as well. So um, in terms of matrix, I've not heard too much personally, but, uh, um, you know, hopefully we do return back to normal sooner rather than later. Do you think from your experience, obviously at matrix and, and working across different facilities, that some pieces of equipment are probably in danger of, of getting phased out, you know, like kind of just sweat machines, aren't they? You know, thinking about people who are probably worried about them. I'm thinking, you know, bikes, treadmills, rowers, their master, you know, do you think they're going to get phased out or it will get into a position where there's only one or two in a gym and it's like, you know, you've, you've got to rent it out rather than you just hop in on out a little bit. Like you said about the, the, um, the cubes, you know, the, the um, stations that you've just mentioned. Um, no, I think they're a mainstay of the gyms, you know, I think uh, that's what a lot of people pay the money for, you know. Um, I think the, the things that facilities have got to consider is how many touch points are going to be, be there, you know, with the big bulky piece of equipment, at least you can track it, so you, you know when someone's used it. I mean, it, it, it goes back to do you know your members well enough? So do, can you trust your members to wipe down each piece of kit that they've been on, you know, every time they've been on it? Um, it I suppose at, at the same time, do you... Do you then look to um, change, like, let's say, group exercise? So group exercise isn't going to return to normal for a long time. So let's say you, you Les Mills classes, uh, as an example, you know, where you're touching different barbells, different plates, uh, different clips. I know you're on the spot, which is the good thing about it at the minute, but, you know, can you actually track and clean every, every single piece there? You know, your functional area is going to be another consideration point as well. You know, you, you've got your Swiss balls, your, your BOSU balls, your kettlebells. There's so much little varieties of kit. You know, you've got to consider like your TRXs. You know, you've got to spend a little bit more time and, uh, you know, in, in your due diligence in terms of cleaning your TRX as well because they're fabric. They're going to absorb sweat like yeah. nothing else. Yeah, um, all that. Your hot yeah, there's, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there's going to be different considerations for different points of the gym, but you know, I think everything comes in swings and roundabouts. You know, like I think if you were looking to design the best thing coming out of uh, COVID, you're probably looking at more station based mm -hmm. because then you can track it. You know exactly what's been used. You know how to clean it. You know where to clean it and how often to clean it as well. Um, the more touch points you have, the harder it is. But at the same time then you won't end up with any functional equipment. <laughs> so you, you're kind of on a bit of a knife edge at the minute. And a lot of it comes down to how much you can trust your members to actually, you know, polish up after themselves, basically. Yeah, I think I agree. I think, as you said there, it is swings around about, you know, it, it come and go. I think in 12 months time, you know, whatever happens in terms of vaccines or, you know, herd immunity, or it like it goes, you know, it, it's, it eventually kind of goes out of, you know, the system. 
you know, everyone, you know, gyms will probably can be what they are currently or what they were, you know, as normal. Um, I just think we're in that sort of period where everyone just needs to, you know, the big, the big gym chains and, the, you know, facilities, they've just got to be extra cautious, haven't they? And extra safe. Um, Cause one, one slip or one mistake can essentially, it's the, it'll put them to bed wouldn't it you know, you know i think it's a, a really good opportunity for for most of the facilities and especially for trainers that they can now get more interactive with their clients yeah. and the actual members within the facilities you know there's, there's probably certain facilities where you know best part of 200 members just pass you by a day and not a lot of trainers may speak to him but now you kind of you can enforce the rules you can now break the ice you can now create conversations and, and now it could be a potential generator to get more clientele in, you can now offer more advice. You can give more, you know, more strict advice out as well in terms of you know starting with the lockdown stuff, but then actually introducing yourself and your products as well. So I think it's a good time uh, for a trainer to start out because you're going to have to engage with these customers in different ways more effectively. You know, similar to uh, your group exercise classes, they're going to have to think on the feet and they're going to have to completely change. Gone are the days where you're running past each other and doing these laps around the sports halls with you know with your different circuits. Everything's going to have to go on the spot. So now you're going to have to change your programming. You're going to change the, the way that you work, you know, music considerations, you know, you, your style is going to have to change as well. You know, I think moving out of lockdown, I think it's, like we said before, there may be a little bit of a hybrid. Um, so you, you may be delivering to 30 people face to face, but you might actually have a camera on delivering to another hundred on in front of you as well. So I think there's, there's a lot of opportunities for this, the, the, the trainers coming out of this as well to actually change and evolve their their products and their actual coaching. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. How um that kind of just got me uh, thinking about obviously your indoor cycling sessions and all that you do that um is the Armitage you do that at the Armitage Centre don't you in Manchester? Yeah. Um, what's the what's the update on that? You know, how, where where are your thoughts of that? What have the centre said? You know, is that kind of the back burner for you know a while really before the gym gets open and stuff like that? Yeah, a lot of their staff have been furloughed, so there's not been much movement there. Um, you know, hopefully it gets up and firing soon um, because it's a great facility to work at. Um, mm -hmm. Got great equipment there and, you know, it's it's something I miss doing. I, I miss engaging with, you know, X amount of clients a, a week. And, you know, I think as a coach, you, you always miss the coaching aspect of things. Mm -hmm. um, you miss engaging with people. I think that's why we do what we do, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So, no, I've not heard much movement at all. Um, but they are a little bit different in the fact that they are seasonal with uh, uni students as well. So right. they go semester by semester. So this this time would actually be quite a, a low time anyway because they'd have just finished exams and, you know, mm. let's say if the students from London, they'd move back to London and so on and so forth. So they go semester by semester most of the time. Okay, that's not too bad then. Um, all right, Al, so what I want to touch upon is... Obviously, what you're doing now with a new business, um, Alex Hurst, Master Trainer. Um, you've recently just announced that. Can you tell us a little bit more, you know, about the new business um, and kind of how that incorporates your personal training background, your education, um, you know, tutoring and session too, but also the recent degree that you're just finishing now, uh, the rehabilitation uh, degree. How, how does that all intertwine and? produces the, the new business really let's know a little bit more about it yeah so in effect i'm going to be offering uh four products um so i'll be offering face-to-face -face training you know whether that's sport specific whether it's general personal training whether you want to work to general goals as an example as well um so i'll be doing the face-to-face -face stuff um you know i'm going to be basing out of a venue which i will announce when it's uh, been signed because again there's been a lot of holdups with this I, I'm not fortunate enough to, to own a facility or anything like that at the minute so um, I'm in talks with a couple of facilities to base out of there um, and then link that to online training as well <clears throat> excuse me so I'm going to be working with up to 30 clients online um, because I think you know for me personally as we mentioned with the pros and cons of, of online training earlier on, um, the thing I wanted to do is keep it personal. I want to keep it as individualized, as bespoke, and they, they get as much as my time as possible. If I spread myself too thin, I just don't think people would get, be getting value for money and they might as well go to a generic product. Um, so I'm going to keep it as, as premium as possible and, and work with low amount of numbers. Um, then I'm going to link that to the sports rehabilitation degree, as mentioned earlier. So it's as I mentioned, it's, it's the kind of the, 
the assessment, the uh, treatment package in terms of injuries and injury prevention. Again, linking that kind of overlapping with a couple of the training methods that we mentioned. Um, and then also, like you've got your therapy on the back of it as well. So you've got your, your hand, hands-on therapy, your exercise therapy, you know, uh, anywhere as far as ultrasound, um, shockwave treatments, you know, whatever is needed, kinesio tape. Uh, again, just to create a bit of a holistic view. So with the sports rehabilitation side, I'm also looking at transitioning from, um, once they finish with the, the sports rehabilitation sessions, they then transition into a client of some form, whether it's a personal training client or whether they go into the online system. Um, because we know with injuries, let's say, you know, if you've got an Achilles tendonitis, as soon as the pain goes, everyone stops the rehab as well. So I'm trying to get people to adhere to their training plan for longer and incorporate into a, you know, a more, more encompassing training program as well. Um, so hopefully they all kind of align and uh, kind of work synergistically as well as individual products, uh, similar to the sports massage. You know, for, for me, sports massage is a maintenance tool. Um, but at the same time, if I could do uh, some training sessions, get to the point of why you need the sports massage sessions, uh, then we can actually work out better movement patterns, increase your mobility, increase your strength through range as well, and make you a better performer, whether that's for, you know, for sports and performance or just for general everyday life as well. Um, so they're, they're the main four pro, uh, products which I'm going to be offering. So the, the sports massage, the sports rehabilitation sessions, face-to-face -face training, and the online training. Um, I'm really looking forward to doing it, to be honest, mate. It's Because uh, a lot of my, like, as we've discussed over the last few years, I've basically been been doing more education than actual one-to-one -one coaching. Um, the main other coaching that I've been doing is the strength and conditioning through the, the rugby teams. Um, but no, I'm, I'm absolutely stoked to get working with people again. As, as I said before, yeah. I love working with people. I love you know getting people towards the goals and you know getting success stories. You know that, that's what it's all about. Again, that's why we all got into the industry and. You know, helping people for the long run. I'd, I don't want people to just come to me and go, uh, just give me a training session. Mm. Well, I'd rather educate you. I'd rather give you the tools for life. You know, as, as we go through the journey together, I want you to be self-sufficient. So by, by the time you get to the end of your goal, if that, if that suits you and you're happy with that, you know exactly how to do it again the next time. If you, you know, if you relapse or if you, if you want to progress that journey a little bit more again. Yeah. So thanks for that, Alex. Um, definitely echo some of that in terms of you know working through with people um interesting there so you've got kind of different sort of entry points then to your service haven't you you know someone who may have an injury who wants to get back fit you know in terms of the rehab stuff you know you've got people who just want to do online training or want to do face-to-face -face training obviously you've got the maintenance of the sports massage there um is there many people offering all of that sort of service in what or is this, you know, are you, are you looking to kind of break into a bit of a niche, a bit of a, a unique thing, especially for the, the local area that you're in? Um, there's not many people in, in my area which are offering a similar thing. I think people are offering similar products, but not kind of overlapping it in the same way. Yeah. Um, so, I, again, my, my product will evolve. You, you know what all businesses are like. They, yeah. they start with a baseline model and then you, you rapidly transition over the first year or so. Um, so... This is how I'm out like it all comes to how I explain it to people and, and how I get people to buy into me and my products and how I train people and how I rehabilitate people. You know, that, that's going to be the main thing. And, you know, going back to, you know, new and aspiring personal trainers, even existing personal trainers, it's, it, it's how you actually, you know, explain yourself. People buy into you. They don't buy into your product as such. You know, the, how many personal trainers are, are there out there? You know, but why they come to you? It, it's for you as an individual. So, you know, hopefully, you know, they're coming for me and they enjoy my product. Uh, you know, that, that's the main thing. But, you know, it's, it, it's going to take a little bit of time in development. But, yeah, I, I think I've found a little bit of a niche to kind of integrate it all in together. Um, and that, that was one of the main things why I got into further education. Like, I, I spent a lot of time going, you know, through professional sport and stuff like that. Never really got a chance to do it initially. But as I went through personal training, I found I just became quite generic. And I wanted to have a bit more of a you know, and a unique selling point, and more more knowledge, obviously, and you know, more more expansive uh, products and more offerings, um, which is where I've got come to at the minute. Because um, I think, in terms of there, I wanted to continue your education to higher education. Um, I know are you, are you are you still starting the SNC in September? Is that still something that you're? Yeah, all signed up. So starting the masters in 
in September. Um, if, if my results come back, happy yeah. days anyway, which, you know, fingers crossed, uh, are going to come through soon and everything will be passed off, uh, fingers crossed. But yeah, the, the Masters will be started off in September. Um, I'm looking forward to that. So that'll be strength and conditioning over at Bolton University again. And is that something that, well, you may not know at the moment, as you said, things things evolve, but is that something long-term that you want to get into? You want to get into that um, performance-based training in terms of teams or individuals as, as an SNC coach? Or is it something that you want to help develop your provision in terms of you know the master trainer business that you're setting up now? Have you kind of yeah. decided yet or still open? A little bit of both, mate. Like, if, because I've done, uh, like, call it SNC if you like I call it more fitness and conditioning because you know I've not got the strength and conditioning title so I kind of work around it and say fitness and conditioning um I've been doing that for the last few years so I've been doing it for this will, this will be my third year going into it with Sedge this year so I've done it with you know national yeah, national league rugby clubs true, yeah. um I've done it with other I've, I've worked with other professional uh, clients before um whether it's education or also one-to-one so you know I said I don't think we can ever stop learning and I, and I think this is just going to provide me um, the certification and the actual application and the knowledge to actually do this more structured and more effectively as well. Mm-hmm. Um, because, it's, you know, good. the more you know, the more. I think, I think a lot of the, the SSC wise is going to be periodization and working through seasons and working through transition phases. You know, you're going through a preparatory phase, you're going through an off season, then it's, Sorry, off season into preparatory phase, then into uh, pre season, then into mid season. You know, how do you adjust all these? different phases of a season um similar to how you periodize uh, per individual clients yeah you know so there's there's a lot more to be worked on and i, I just i'm a geek i, I absolutely yeah. love learning I, you know i've got journals coming out of my ears i'm always reading i'm always researching i've got daft amount of books <laughs> um i just want to know more you know just so i can make myself a better trainer and clinician but i, I can also make myself a, a better educator for everyone as well yeah, definitely, mate. I'm uh, as, again. I echo that. You know what I'm like. I'm got loads of little certs and all that. I'm, I'm the same. Like you've got to keep learning and, and keep trying to find out more information. And the more you keep learning, the more you know. Hopefully, you know more to to uh, use in different situations and and different uh, environments. So definitely echo that. So I do want to touch upon your experience as a tutor. Um, and a little bit of advice for new PTs. But just before we move on to that, Al, um, I just want to talk about how you found the experience of developing the business in terms of the website, the social media, the marketing, you know, how have you found that? Is it something that's come naturally to you or has it been a completely new experience? Have you used any different um, platforms or um, agencies? Or how, how has that whole experience been for you? Because I know a lot of new personal trainers, all personal trainers who've got a bit of experience, um, do sometimes struggle or don't really know where to look about that. It's been quite enjoyable, to be honest. And it's quite eye-opening in terms of what support is actually out there. You know, I think, uh, you know, for, for my marketing, my, my brand, my logo, my uh, website, I've gone through a company called Kayak Studios, who I can't recommend enough. They've been absolutely wicked and, you know, re- really supportive through this, the whole pit, uh, through the whole transition and building of the the products and the website, um, you know, it, it, it's you know, as I went through speaking to people and getting quotes, you know, I could get a logo, I could get a logo from anywhere, I could get it in different colours, I could get that from anywhere, and you know, I even got recommended to go and build my own website, which you know is is cost effective, but I wanted to build a brand which was substantial. You know, yeah. it's going to be lasting me for the next ten years. I don't want to go on, you know, to I don't know the first thing about how to write a website. I could learn. I could make it probably relatively effective. But I think to have the support and moving forward to create what should your product look like? What's the feel of it? You know, you consider the genre. How, how are you writing it? How is your, your pitch going to be in terms of video content? Are you going to write, be presented in third person? Are you going to be presented in first person? That all comes into your you know, your, your whole package and your whole branding, which you want to deliver. So, um, yeah, I went with Kayak in terms of uh, the website and the, de- the design-wise. So just wanted to get a good feel on that one. Um, and then I supported it with, you know, little applications like Bonjoro. So Bonjoro are doing the video responses. 
so for email requests so or email inquiries so you can send a, a short clip it video to to your new inquiries uh, and have a, a contact point straight away uh linking that with mailchimp so you can uh now start to design your campaigns um some of this is is new and old but you know this is what i've been discovering and, and learning quite rapidly so in terms of your campaigns you can you know schedule emails uh, make them very bespoke to you and make them look very professional at the same time uh, and then you can create your database of uh, how many people are in that as well especially linking to your inquiries on the website and so on and so forth um i use a system called trainerize for the okay. personal training system um that's one that i found is the best fit for me there's a lot out there my pt hub um true coach trainerized things like that they're all absolutely excellent but they all have this slight little different niches and stuff like that why, why, um, my, um, sorry Al, to jump in why did you pick trainerized as opposed to the others um, the accountability I, I i got them recommended from a, a friend of ours from uh over at rugby um and i found them very uh bespoke and very good in terms of the accountability you can create habits you can track the sleeping you can track the nutrition you can track the the adherence to the exercise plan you see every time they log in you see you get feedback instantly um i, I just found it a, a very good all-round package so um they're the ones that i i believed in the most I'm, I, there's great usability from absolutely all of the systems um i, I wouldn't tarnish or give mm -hmm. a bad name to any of them but th that's just the one that best suited me you know especially linking into you know the, the sports rehabilitation side as well i just thought that created the best accountability for me and my clients um calendly that's one that i discovered off you off yourself yeah, yeah you know that that was really good but that's now integrated into the website as well you know to to book in your consultations and uh your review points as well um and then you know linking it to the social media so I'm, I'm creating new social social media content as we go through. You know, it's it's not been it's not up and firing yet, but you know, even as such as I booked out a couple of data to now start filming all my exercises. You know, it's going to take you know probably the best part of a, a good year or two to get a full exercise library of where where I want it. But you know, I need to make a start and you know start building it as, as soon as possible. But um, all of its content that you can reuse and regurgitate and. You know, it's to make a, a personal experience for, for your client. You know, the last thing your clients want is, uh, you know, someone else representing your your business and brand when it's actually you that's selling it. You know, so you need to make it the full personal feeling and make you an integral part of it rather than, you know, everyone else. Mm -hmm. No, perfect. Cheers, Al. Um, okay, then. So, as I said, I wanted to touch upon your experiences within education. Uh, which kind of applies more to us at Vector and, and some of our students who will be coming on our courses. Um, you know, you are a specialist tutor for, for us at Vector, so you deliver on our PT courses uh, now. You've joined the team, which, which is great. Um, can you just tell us a little bit more about your experiences as a tutor and assessor and where you kind of see the industry at the moment, you know, at the moment, you know, especially around COVID, it's you know, qualify at home in your, in your underpants, you know, 100% online courses, you know, what were your experiences and what like the down, downfalls of these sort of uh, courses would you say for those who are looking to get into the industry? Again, I think it's, it's got to be tailored towards the user. Um, I, think, I think that's a fundamental part of any course. You know, are you an audible learner, are you a visual learner, are you a kinesthetic learner? Are you someone who needs to go out and actually do it and feel it kind of thing? Um, you know, for me, I think it's got to be a, a mixture of the two, a, a mixture of, you know, hearing it, seeing it, and then doing it. And so a mixture of the three, then <laughs> bad maths, wasn't it? <laughs> um, you know, but making it adaptable and making it bespoke to each learner is hard to do via, via a computer. You know, so, you know, I, I go off, you know, visual expressions, body language, and then actually questioning, questioning as well and making sure the knowledge is there because anyone can do a competency test online. Does that actually make them competent? I think you learn a lot of the knowledge online. Uh, you know, let's say anatomy and physiology, if you read in the right way, you could, you know, you can get most of the knowledge from that, but can you apply it? And it's, I think a lot of the, the skill actually comes in teaching people how to coach and how to be a coach. Um, they're the main fundamental factors which I see from online courses to face-to-face. To face. Um, 
so there, there is pros and cons you know let's say if you're a, a savvy learner you, you've been and done a, a college course or a uni course or you've, you've had a, a really good uh, background in uh, sporting performance for, for argument's sake then maybe an online course may be a little bit more accommodating for you but at the same time how do you know how to work with four or five different people let's say so let's say when you know back when i used to deliver um the premier training face-to-face -face, when we used to do the the face-to-face -face courses you could have up to 20 25 students in a room all 20 25 students in that room have different postures have different mm -hmm. movements have different strengths have different weaknesses have different backgrounds and it was an integrated learning style from each other as well as from myself and it's, it's about getting that information out and, and kind of absorbing it um you know let's say as you're looking at deadlift mechanics as you're looking at squat mechanics as you're looking at pe how people uh, bench press you've now got 25 people in the room that you can now watch and see their different movement the correct patterns but also on the flip side the, the, the poor movement patterns which we can work on then we can deviate off in different directions because obviously you've got you know you're you learning concepts which you want to learn from that session but i think you know especially myself being on different courses i've always learned more when coaches deviate um and go into actual application and it's yeah. hard to do that online you've got a, a strict schedule you've got that one hour time slot or whatever it is um and that and you're getting to the point you know the point and then you kind of going a little bit around it as well that, that, that's my personal opinion um you know a little bit subjective obviously so yeah you know not um not everyone will think the same as me um but you know i've, I've coached over 500 people in the, you know since i started coaching um or educating should i say um and that's the main feedback i get people come to, you know as, as i said for um personal training people come for you at the end of the day like and people initially sign up to the the, the, the brand but they remember the coach mm. and, and it's how much of a of a story how much of a journey how much support and how much education can we provide to make it a full application rather than just picking up how to learn where a, a bicep goes to and from how to do a basic squat not the rest of the party and the rest of the, the features behind it yeah I, t I totally get where you're coming from and look you know as you said we're obviously subjective you know because we we are big believers of you know face to face and our big mantra is get trained on the gym floor because ultimately you know it doesn't really matter if you qualify and just go into online personal training you, you still can't tell people what to do yeah. via a screen if you've never done it on the gym floor anyway um so you know it is subjective and i do understand and do agree that some people are suited to the online um type of programs um so yeah I, I definitely echo that in terms of those who are thinking about coming onto courses uh, whether that be online you know face to face blended you know there's, there's totally there's totally um, a array um of options out there at the moment what would be your three biggest tips or bits of advice for those who want to get into the industry as a personal trainer um now i think do your research i think you know a lot of people come onto the courses and just think, you know, I'm, I'm going to learn the basics and then, uh, and then I'll, I'll create these funky magic exercises. <laughs> you know, there's not this level three, you get your level three manual, but there's no kind of extra package where you go, that's how you actually apply it. So I think, you know, point number one is learn the basics, be a master of the basics because training never really changes. You know, I've, been lucky enough to play at international level i've been lucky enough to educate at you know quite high standards as well mm. and the basics of training never never really change you know so the, the basic movement patterns um the basic uh flow of a session so you you know you, you warm up protocols then your main session then you cool down and it's just how you bespoke it to the individual so i think be, being an absolute master in the in the basics is is the first thing i would take away for a, a new trainer coming on board um second be open like you never stop learning i think a lot of people come into the industry and go oh i've got my level three qualification now i'm that's it and i've made it you know there's a lot more there's a lot more to learn it's like you know the, the simplest way and it's a bit of a corny reference but it's like passing your driving test you know you, you go in 10 to 2 driving you put your indicator on all the time you like, as soon as you drive out that test center with your pass you start to deviate and do it slightly different so the first thing that you, you need to make sure you do is find your own system but 
you know, sticking to the basics and carry on learning. Um, you know, I think with as an addendum to that, your clientele is going to tell you which way you want to go with your education. You you may have a um, a little bit of a specific route which you want to go down, but you know, especially in my early years, I just dove into every course that I saw, everything under the sun. Uh, there was no method to the madness. I wasted a lot of money, um, a lot of time just going to these courses where I may have picked up one golden nugget from, and and that was about it. <laughs> but they weren't applied to me and my clientele. So um, learn learn the basics from the level three, apply it really well. And then start to deviate off how you want to, you know, whether that's pre and postnatal, whether it's a sports massage qualification, whether it's a level four strength and conditioning, you know, that, that's going to be the second piece of advice I'll, I'll give. Um, thirdly, don't, don't be influenced by social media. <laughs> uh, be, be careful with what's out there. You know, the social media is absolutely perfect for so many people and there's so much good advice out there but there's also so much tosh and wish watch and you know stuff that just doesn't make sense and you know something that I've been looking at recently so all of my social media has been keto supplements um they've been popping up here there and everywhere and for me I'm, I'm not sort of formed an opinion on them yet I've just dove into seven uh, journals <laughs> that I've found you know just to kind of base my opinion on it um so I think, you know, linking back to the, the constant research, you've, you've got to understand um, why it's there to, to have a, a fully all round an opinion on it as well. But, you know, with, with, with Instagram and stuff like that, find your own personality, but, you know, make sure you are giving credible information and make sure it is correct. You know, the, the, the amount of poor sessions that you're seeing out there and the amount of poor tips that you're seeing out there and people that are just, you know, kind of being sponsored and, and saying this, that, and the other. It's, yeah. It's hard, isn't it? You know, um, it's just a never ending minefield. You know, there's certain people who I can recommend to, but, um, you, you know, so just use social media wisely. And, and that probably links into your branding as well. Make sure you've got a personality to it and make sure you it has the same kind of feel to every post, you know, whether it's your logo in the background, whether you introduce yourself in the same way, have a common theme. Um, so I think social media is going to be a, a big driving factor, especially over the next couple of years. It has been already, hasn't it? But, you know, it's just going to turbocharge with the current conditions. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, yeah, I think you're definitely right on that. There's a lot of alternate, alternative uh, motives, isn't there, on, on social uh, media in terms of, you know, who are people getting funded by or, you know, what are freebies, etc. cetera. Um, mm -hmm. so definitely, definitely agree on that. Just on uh, your point about researching and always learning, at the moment, I know you, you said you dive into journals and you, you, you've got access to academic journals because of your, your degree. I know you'll, you'll still be on the library and that won't you still be able to get stuck into a lot of it. But where you can, get a lot of credible information online, yeah, my Google Scholar. Where, where and can people find um, information to continue to learn? Would you say what would be your, your biggest uh, sources? Um... Let me have a quick look because I've got some up already. Uh, like I say, Google Scholar is a big one. Um, you know, it's free, it's easy to use. Um, and you just click in a couple of whatever you want to find, realistically. Um, where is it? I've lost all my research. <laughs> Here we go. So you've got ones like. Uh, there's one called Healthline, which I like. Um, that's more of a website, so it's not necessarily journals, but they're all researched um, and backed. Uh, I, I quite like their, their products because they then also attach all their references as well, which you can break down. So let's say if they make a certain statement, you can then go and follow up with a certain point which they have used um which then you know it makes it a little bit academic um you know some people may find that really boring but if you want to get the accurate information then you know you need to do it um you've got ncbi um which is one of the academic websites as well um they just post journal after journal um you've got i suppose that the things to avoid for me is, is stuff like you know going on you know bodybuilding.com and getting you know Derek, the PT from Wales, his opinion on something, you know, make sure it is credible information. Yeah. Um, you know, even stuff like, you know, PT on the net, uh, Fit, Fit Pro, 
fit girl magazines fit girl uh, contents online you know everything like that which is a little bit more supported and you know some of it can be anecdotal but most of it is supported and resource uh, researched resource um so the the more the more you can get that's research that i think is the better um even from books and journals and articles that they're, they're more uh, appropriate as well mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay perfect um thanks for that al you've got loads of information there um loads of uh, really shiny golden nuggets uh, for those who, who will catch this episode, especially those who want to become these uh, personal trainers. Sorry, um, and personal trainers, you know, talked about the industry and, and kind of that freelance um, basis. So, uh, thanks for that. Really appreciate you coming on, um, and no problem. Um, we'll catch up very shortly. No problem. Thank you for having me, and good luck right. to all the, the trainers out there who are looking to jump on board with the courses. Can't wait to work with some of them. Yeah. Will do. Cheers, Al. Thanks for having me, mate. Speak to you soon. Bye.